Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and to discuss this topic with people who've been thinking about it uh, perhaps as long as I have. There is, in fact, a major project on it. And in hoping to contribute to that project, I will be perhaps occasionally referring to the situation in Europe. But it's, of course, the situation in the US that I know best. Now, by way of introduction, I want to mention some guiding metaphors. I think it was Max Weber who said that science can give us a map of reality but cannot tell us where to go. What he meant, I think, is that scientific inquiry does not tell us about what is intrinsically good, or anyway, identify things as intrinsically good, as opposed to being merely instrumentally good. In my metaphor, we need in life not just a map of reality, but an itinerary. When you have a map, you may know how to get to various destinations, but you won't thereby know what destinations are worth getting to. When you have an itinerary, you will have destinations that you intend to reach. And when you have a good itinerary, the destinations you intend to reach will be worth visiting, maybe even worth living in. So what does it take for education to help us in developing a good life itinerary? If you emphasize just the purely intellectual side, you're looking at what it takes to have a good map. That's not enough. Nobody can live with a map alone. Now, how much should a university say about what should be offered to students beyond a map? Russell was a wit. And he said somewhere, I read this long ago, education has an essentially twofold purpose, to develop the mind and to train the citizen. The Athenians concentrated on the former, the Spartans on the latter. The Spartans won, but the Athenians were remembered. Well, of course, we want both to win and to be remembered. And perhaps that is how it should be at a good university. Part two is on the humanities and the sciences. I think of the humanities as paradigmatically and in merely alphabetical order, history, literature, and philosophy. And the natural sciences, of course, encompass physics, chemistry, and biology. And we can refine either list, but that's enough to work with. Now, there is a certain stereotype that I imagine we've all been trying to undermine. That of the sciences as soft and of the human, uh, the, uh, as hard and of the humanities as soft. We also hear of the humanities as subjective and the sciences as being objective. Um, and we can be told by those who don't think enough about it that the sciences are a domain of proof and the humanities are a domain of speculation. Well, these stereotypes simply won't do. The social sciences um, are pretty soft in places if one insists on speaking of what's hard and soft. Logic is as hard as any discipline gets. Logic in involves proofs. So does pure mathematics. Actual working scientific work does not admit of proof except in its mathematical segments. One is consigned to inductive argumentation, which gives us degrees of probability for our hypotheses and theories, it doesn't prove them. A proof has to be, strictly speaking, a valid deductive argument from certain premises, premises that are certain. And science doesn't pretend to start with premises that are certain. So the stereotypes fall apart quickly upon analysis. And one of the jobs of philosophy, of course, is to clarify stereotypes and undermine them where necessary, which is usually um, centrally and sometimes from top to bottom. Now, I see the sciences as exhibiting methodological continuity. But it's very hard to say just what the methodology of science is. Science is empirically responsive to nature. It's typically maybe arguably essentially experimental, 
but uh, astronomy does a great deal of scientific work through observation and theorizing on the basis of that without actually having enough control of the natural phenomena in question to do experiments in the usual sense. So astronomy is a pretty hard science, but is it an experimental science? Well, it depends on how you take experiment. But the more broadly you take experiment, uh, the closer you come to allowing historiography of a certain kind to be experimental, since you can, after all, predict that certain things will be found that will have historical implications. Now, I've already said that there's methodological continuity among the sciences, the social sciences included, which certainly are experimental and responsive to the natural world. Um, but there's also methodological continuity between the sciences and the humanities, most prominently between the social sciences and the humanities. But there's something I call theoretical method, which is prominent in any kind of systematic thinking. Theoretical method is a method of confronting generalizations with data and reviewing data in the light of generalizations. Sometimes we decide our data are corrupt or inaccurate. Sometimes we decide that our generalizations need revision. This happens in any serious intellectual inquiry. So theoretical method is not the property of the sciences. It belongs to any kind of systematic thought and it represents continuity between empirical thinking in the sciences and either empirical or a priori non-empirical thinking in the humanities. Even in mathematics, you will have instances <coughs> and generalizations as well as proofs. I think that readies me for part three on vocationalism and intellectualism as orientations in higher education. But if something simply goes too fast, feel free to wave a hand and we'll try to deal quickly with something I leave unclear. Now, I want to say that both vocationalism and intellectualism are too narrow. I've already said that intellectualism of one kind is too narrow. This would be the kind concerned with simply giving us a map of reality, truths about nature, truths about human psychology, with no indication of what is intrinsically valuable, what is worth wanting. But of course, practical emphases in education, higher or lower, can be too narrow. Vocationalism is the name a number of us give to the perspective on education that places a specialization at the center and particularly what we call a vocation in the sense of uh, an area that can earn someone a living. <coughs> Now, education should help one with any vocation, but should not be subordinated to someone unless it is specialty education. Specialty education should be more the business of graduate programs in the university than undergraduate programs, it seems to me. However, uh, even a graduate program can be too vocationalist. So philosophy, which I know best among the fields, has enormous interdisciplinary applications and applications to the conduct of life in general, in the activity of citizens, in families, in teaching, in the arts. Now, I would say, and this bears now on both vocationalism and intellectualism, that modern life is nothing if not diverse and unpredictable. So, what we should be doing is in part strengthening the central processing unit, if you'll permit me a computer metaphor. And philosophy certainly does that. And I think the humanities do it a great deal. We try to strengthen the capacity of people to deal with problems of any sort so that a problem is clarified, dimensions of the problem are distinguished, we sometimes divide and conquer, looking at one dimension first and then another, and then bringing the dimensions together. And we emphasize the capacity to adapt what one has learned to any vocational needs. Vocations change so rapidly in the contemporary world that retraining is often necessary. So the ability to assimilate retraining 
to shift gears is extremely important in modern life. Job change is important. Many don't really stay in any narrowly defined vocation, if indeed in the same basic field. So we have to train the mind generally and should not overstress just the cognitive, the sort of factual knowledge, cartographic dimension. Now, regarding the general matter of science, technology, and human values, which many people try to bring together in higher education, it's important to distinguish science from technology, and it's important in understanding universities to do it because a lot of money that universities get from government and from um, business comes from technological contributions, which are not the same as scientific contributions. Scientists as such are interested in understanding the world. Technology is concerned with using natural and other resources for the convenience of life. And that kind of engineering project, important and scientific though it is, does not exhaust science. And it draws on science, whereas science does not have to draw on technology apart from its needs for equipment. So a university should, I think, at least at the uh, undergraduate level and in general programs of science, favor science over technology, but technology is very important and a technical university such as you have in the Netherlands um, can justify giving special emphasis to technology. But I note the Netherlands has had the good sense to develop programs concentrating on ethical issues of technology and the philosophy of technology, which involves such things as what counts as an artifact versus um, a mere object. Now, when we talk about human values, which um, everyone understands should go with an emphasis on science and technology, we have to watch out for an ambiguity. I don't know whether it's as prominent in Dutch as it is in English, but it's very easy to confuse values as things of value that have worth with values as psychological valuings. Valuing can be mistaken in the way belief can be. And as I see it, if you want a one-liner, we can say that valuing is to the good as believing is to the true. If you believe what isn't true, you've made a mistake. If you value what isn't any good, you've made a mistake. If it isn't at least instrumentally good, it's a really bad mistake. If it's instrumentally good at best, and not good in itself, and you think it's good in itself, so it's one of your ends, that's a really bad mistake. You're going to the wrong destination. Your itinerary will not be satisfying. So when we talk about human values, we have to distinguish between the valuable and what is valued. And now one issue is whether what is valuable is a construct out of values. Could we, as some philosophers think, determine what is valuable by seeing what people value on reflection or where certain errors are eliminated. So this brings us to the question, which I won't pursue here, of whether a naturalistic worldview can do adequate justice to the good and the bad. Can we, for example, uh, by combining philosophical with scientific techniques, determine uh, with no value commitments at the starting point what is worth putting on our itinerary? I suspect the answer is no. So that philosophical reflection, general humanistic and theological reflection are needed to determine what is really worth valuing. Now, I ask at the end of part three, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, part, uh, where, uh, part four, I uh, know, part three, sorry, a little jet lag. I, I ask whether science or science education can be value-free? A major question. I'm a defender of the view that scientific practice in principle can be free of moral commitments. So let's be careful here. The question whether we should pursue a certain subject matter may involve moral values. Should we, for instance, pursue the treatment of cancer uh, over the treatment of AIDS if our resources are limited? After all, everybody gets cancer, not everybody gets AIDS. So you could say that settles it, and that the scientist who chooses here is making a value judgment. 
But of course, it isn't the scientist as such who's making the value judgment. It's the science as citizen, as someone applying for a grant, who's making the value judgment. The science is a matter of what you do when you have decided what subject matter you're going to approach. And in deciding whether your hypothesis is any good, you have to make epistemic, roughly evidential value judgments, but those are not moral. They might be influenced by your moral views, but ideally they shouldn't be. So I would say myself that science, science education can be value free in one sense, but to imagine that scientists are immune to commitments as to what is worth studying is naive. So there will be an interaction between people's moral and other normative views and their scientific views in the real business of scientific inquiry. And certainly that applies to humanistic inquiry. Now in part four, I thought it would be useful to say a word about the humanities and the professions. The professions in American parlance anyway are paradigmatically law, medicine, teaching. Um, business is not usually considered a profession, but everybody understands that you can do business professionally or in the way an amateur does. So how do the humanities affect the professions and are they crucial? Well, I've already said that however pure a methodology might be in science or uh, even in teaching, um, there will be value commitments of a normative kind and probably a moral kind that determine what subject matter is worth teaching because you can't teach them all, how a subject matter should be taught, how to regard one's students, how to treat one's experimental subjects. Those are all matters for moral and other normative decisions. So I think the humanities bear enormously on the capacity to do the work of the professions. To be more specific, take literature as stimulating the imagination. And uh, bear in mind that science is not just a matter of testing hypotheses given in either the history of the subject or by foundations who want to fund projects. It takes imagination to frame a good hypothesis, one that it's worth testing, one which if it is sufficiently confirmed will be the basis for good theory. So having imagination often makes all the difference between making progress and um, working in a rut or just uh, having one unpromising hypothesis after another, sometimes requiring vast expenditures for testing. What about narrative, which we have in literature? What about uh, the kinds of intuitive examples used in philosophy, prominently in ethics, epistemology, also in metaphysics. Well, a narrative stimulates the imagination and it also makes applications of the abstract concrete and enables us better to evaluate hypotheses. This again evokes theoretical method. A narrative helps you to evolve uh, good comparisons between generalizations and the data to which generalizations are responsible. History is a bulwark against bigotry, rigidity, and dogmatism. Seeing the enormous variety of institutions and practices in human history is very salutary if one thinks one's way is the only good way. And if one is rigid about changes, some of which uh, may be in a direction we used to know, some of which may be in a direction we've never gone. There's more than one way here for progress to occur. Now philosophy is, I think, methodologically and in subject matter neutral, at least in certain applicable dimensions so that, uh, of course, uh, philosophy will use a little different method in ethics than it will in metaphysics, but we will have applications to any number of human situations in ethics, any number of abstract situations in metaphysics. And philosophy can focus on subjects of all sorts. That's the subject matter neutrality. 
there are philosophical problems about the sciences, about human action, about uh, human relations, private and public, about citizenship. So the techniques of analysis and um, explication are neutral as to subject matter. And I think useful for the arts, religion, science, professional work. Now, what about the universities here in relation to the humanities and the professions? Well, it seems to me the universities should emphasize the humanities as core subject matter, valuable for those doing science or uh, doing things in the humanities or in such professions as medicine, as clinical practice, where you don't have medical science so much as applications of medical science to healing. So um, philosophy indicates models for analysis and for communication. And here I would emphasize the contribution of the humanities to communicative capacity. Whereas in mathematics and the natural sciences, communication can be very largely through the use of symbolic formulations that are quite technical and very compressed. In the humanities, natural languages are the main basis of communication. And where people learn to communicate well in philosophy, by implication, they are able to communicate well in matters that involve ordinary citizens, in uh, even child rearing. And child rearing these days with children exposed to the internet very early in life is really quite intellectually demanding. I have myself argued with articulate teenagers. I was very grateful for my philosophical training in having to argue with articulate teenagers. And it seems to me that even in elementary schools, we can have uh, people who have not had adequate philosophical training propagating error. There was for a long time in the American public schools, and there may still be in some places, a fact and opinion unit. So my children came home with the idea that um, it's a matter of opinion that Beethoven was a great composer as it's a matter of opinion whether chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla. Well, what had happened was that bad philosophy and um, slapdash social science assimilated the judgment of artistic matters in which there is reason and experience and sensibility to mere matters of taste. It's one thing to say that that Beethoven was a great composer is a matter of value. It's another thing to say it's a matter of opinion. It's just terribly misleading to say that's a matter of opinion. Whatever your view of uh, aesthetic value and aesthetic appreciation. So um, as it happens, stereotypes can be drawn from slapdash humanistic education or a kind of professional trespass where cliches that start in philosophy are taken up in the social sciences and then transmitted in teacher education to become the would-be facts in elementary school. This is all very distressing, but it just shows you how a good humanistic education can figure even in child rearing. Part five, university education, public policy, and responsible citizenship. You'll forgive me for saying philosophy is a paradigm in the humanities, but it is, after all, both interdisciplinary and metadisciplinary. Philosophy is interdisciplinary because we deal with problems very much of the kind psychologists deal with, but we deal with them more conceptually and less empirically. But there isn't a sharp distinction between a conceptual question about what constitutes an action and an empirical question about how actions are rooted in the overall control system we all have. So philosophy is interdisciplinary there. It's interdisciplinary for literature, which after all has a cognitive side for the arts, which involves sensibility and perception, perception being a major philosophical topic. Philosophy is metadisciplinary because it is a metadiscipline. Part of the business of philosophy is to look at the other disciplines and understand their logic, their standards of evidence, what they have in common, how they can fruitfully interact with one another. 
and of course philosophy, but also literature and history and the sciences too, will engage in clarification of myriad kinds. Philosophical clarification operates on notions that everybody has to use in making everyday decisions and in intelligently voting. We also clarify methodology in the various sciences. But of course, a, a scientist can clarify the methods of the science uh, that is the person's specialty and can compare those methods with others, perhaps indicating how they're commonsensical and how they might be uncommonsensical but nonetheless sound. Now there's also the matter of argumentation. Well, of course, logic and critical thinking concern what sorts of argumentation are acceptable. And this is a very subtle matter. Not all bad argumentation involves invalidity as opposed to other kinds of faults that are much subtler. And validity alone doesn't make for good argumentation. No number of valid arguments with false premises can be counted upon to take us from our premises to any truths. What about definition? Definition of concepts and ideas of any importance is extremely difficult. And one of the things philosophers have to remember, and I think all teachers have to remember, maybe all parents have to remember, is that many of the things we need to define are very familiar. Democracy is familiar. Belief, knowledge, explanation. But if you try to get an understanding of these terms by using your best dictionary, you're unlikely to go very far. You may get straight error, as is not well known, because dictionaries are usually consulted to find out the meanings of terms one doesn't know that are unfamiliar. Who looks up belief in a dictionary who isn't a philosopher exploring what the lexicographers might have come up with, right? Well. It's a sad fact of life, but one that cries out for humanistic rectification, that we can have a mastery of the use of a term with little ability to begin defining it. Philosophers are forced to try to define um, what is very difficult to define, or at least to provide some necessary conditions or some sufficient conditions so we have anchors for the use of the terms. Now, there is a danger of frustrating others uh, by being a little bit too explicitly precise or by calling attention to faulty definitions and faulty uses. I remember a, a faculty meeting in which literary colleagues said that students needed a tolerance for ambiguity. And I said as politely as I could that I thought the intention was to speak of a tolerance for uh, vagueness or indeterminacy, but ambiguity involving two or more distinct meanings that could be perhaps clearly stated and treated separately, that wasn't what we needed a tolerance for. Ambiguity should really be resolved, whereas we have to live with vagueness and indeterminacy. I didn't put it quite like that. Um, I'm afraid my side was outvoted and a tolerance for ambiguity was put into the list of academic desiderata for that program. Okay, so now this brings us to the matter of negotiation and tolerance. Those are subjects for ethics and other branches of the humanities, of course. All right, making distinctions, a main business of philosophy. Well, if you don't make distinctions, you don't know what all your options are. If you don't know what all your options are, how well can you negotiate? People can be divided because they haven't found the gradations of positions between them where A might move a little closer to B on this and B might move a little closer to A on that. And pretty soon we have um, you know, mutual toleration uh, even if we don't get to harmony. Deduction of consequences from positions and from policy statements. If you, for example, have a position on euthanasia, well, what is euthanasia? And do you distinguish between killing a patient and letting die? What do you do about hastening death? Is hastening death by heavy doses of morphine killing? Or is it letting die uh, more um, humanely because death is certain and uh, suffering is uh, the main experience the patient is having? Well, we have to make all these distinctions, and we do. Now, it will be plain that I've been illustrating some applications of moral philosophy to policy questions and the responsibilities of citizenship. 
I've myself done a lot of work uh, on something that's interdisciplinary involving law and theology and political science, for example. I've worked on the ethics of citizenship where religious and political considerations clash or interact. Should a citizen who is religious have any constraints on bringing religious considerations to bear in lawmaking? Or must a religious citizen abstract from re religious considerations and uh, support laws only when purely secular considerations justify them? Well, I think we need a subtler uh, position than that suggests, and it turns out there's a huge range of subtleties here. Now, yesterday, talking to the PPE group, I brought up wisdom and practical judgment as elements essential in decision making that come in where different values conflict. Conflicts of values come up in every domain of human life, from interpersonal relations between uh, lovers, to child rearing, to relations between peers, teachers and students, fellow citizens. And we don't always have a rule we can apply that we could, so to speak, plug into an informed computer to grind out a decision. We have to exercise judgment. Aristotle spoke of achieving a mean between excess and deficiency. That's a very good way to look at things, but we can say more. Often, after the fact, when judgment has been made, we can test that judgment by trying to generalize from the facts that led to the judgment to the kind of uh, outcome that we recommend. And it's good to be able to do that. So this again illustrates theoretical method, an interplay between the level of data and individual judgment uh, to generalization, guiding judgments in hypothetical cases, future cases as well. But I'm afraid that there's no substitute for judgment in cases where quantification and uh, past data will not tell us what to do. And judgment is one of the capacities humanistic education is devoted to developing. So we have Aristotle's golden mean, we have various skills involving what we call knowing how to do things. Now I think I'm ready for part six and I promised to be as brief as possible, so I will go to that. What about the matter of meaningful life? Shouldn't an education make it more likely that people will have a meaningful life in some sense? Well, there are many meanings of meaningful life, but there are some paradigms of meaninglessness in life, and I like Macbeth's final speech as an indication of what can happen when somebody is at the bottom. Not at the bottom from ignorance, but at the bottom from error, a lot of it moral error, involving having the wrong values and some of the right values, but being misled as to how they're realized. Macbeth says, and you know this, I think, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's nihilism. That's being at the bottom, and articulately at the bottom. Well, we don't want any of our students ever to end up there. And of course, we don't want to end up there. No itinerary, and the itinerary you've had has come to nothing. So, is the meaningful life the good life, and are we to teach the good life? Well, yes, indirectly, but a meaningful life Alas, doesn't have to be good. A good life, I think, does have to be meaningful. 
What is meaningful life? Well, it's going to involve identifying things of intrinsic value. I distinguish intrinsic value from inherent value. They're both values things have in themselves non-instrumentally. So there's intrinsic value in the experience of beautiful music, in the experience of good conversation. There's inherent value in um, a literary work that we enjoy, but it's not an experience. But its value isn't merely as a means to something else. But lots of life uh, confronts us with things just of instrumental value. We'd rather do without these things if only we could get to the really good things that they lead to. Now, you've got to know the difference between what's just of instrumental value and what's of intrinsic value if you're ever going to find out what destinations are worth going to and living in. So the theory of value is extremely important and just practicing value judgments by assessing things in the arts, in philosophy, in science, that's worth a great deal. By assessment and refinement of judgment, uh, we move closer to discerning what is intrinsically valuable. Now, as I see it, a meaningful life cannot be value-free, and there's no reason why education has to be value-free. It should be free of bigotry and bias, but certain values are sound as certain propositions are true, and we don't have to pretend that it's just a matter of cultural opinion that what the Nazis did was wrong, and that the flourishing of the arts and sciences and conversation um, and sports, those things are good. Um, so, as I see it, uh, there are certain things whose value may need explication. Uh, there are difficulties in ranking values to determine what life you particularly want. But uh, a university doesn't have to turn its back on there being a difference between the good and the bad, and the right and the wrong. Now, is meaningful life possible under naturalism, roughly the world view on which, putting it very broadly, nature is all there is, and the only basic truths are truths of nature? Well, I think if you take that view, you're missing something. But you could, of course, say, well, it's really a truth about the natural world that Beethoven is a great composer. I mean, he gives a lot of pleasure. But of course, a machine could give a lot of pleasure if it manipulated the brain right. So you can't naturalize value that easily. And it's not at all clear that value can be naturalized. If it can be naturalized, I think it'll, be turn, it'll turn out to be something about as complex as uh, sophisticated uh, humanists, humanities scholars dealing with all this have thought. Now, I, I want to add also that a meaningful life should involve, if I'm right about humanity anyway, meaningful work. So one thing a university can emphasize is what it is to determine a way of working that is meaningful that will fit various kinds of lives. We can't be narrowly vocationalist because um, that doesn't conduce particularly to the meaningfulness of work, but it also won't prepare people for meaningful work in some different kind of job or vocation should they need it. But certainly preparation for meaningful work of a general kind, and in a broad sense, is within the purview of the aims of the university. So very, very broadly you can see that I'm thinking of the university as having a role in enhancing hum human capacity and in supporting citizenship. It is essential that a democracy have universities, and a democracy will not flourish without good universities, it seems to me. So much work lies ahead, but I feel optimistic about our capacity to do it. Thank you.